begin, let me just add our welcome this morning. We're so glad you are here with us. Welcome to our Mill Creek community that is with us via simulcast this morning as we um, come to the conclusion of our study of James that we've been a part of throughout this summer. Um, I don't know if you've ever gone out and purchased IKEA furniture or that ready to assemble frame. Anybody done that before? Like I, I, I'm a, a woodworker, um, so like IKEA is kind of like our arch enemy. Um, like we 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 hate them. Um, but every once in a while, my my wife will be like, I don't have six years to wait for you to build a bookshelf. So why why don't we go out and and do something about this? And so occasionally we'll go over there and. And of course, it's a little overwhelming when you're there, there's stuff everywhere, but the, the premise, the whole idea behind it is that this is supposed to be so simple, right? But if you've ever bought a desk or something, a dresser from there, and you brought it home and it's in this really thin box and you open it up and there's about 1800 parts that are there for you, and then a set of directions that includes like three pictures and no words. And you're supposed to take all of this and somehow magically put it together and, and resemble the piece of furniture that you bought. As a matter of fact, you can Google IKEA fails, and there's just all these pictures of dilapidated furniture where chairs on legs are going the wrong direction, and drawers and dressers are upside down. Um, because the promise of it seems so simple and straightforward and clear, right? But our experience with it well, oftentimes that is a little bit more complicated. And as we come to the conclusion of this letter today, James is going to specifically deal with the issue of prayer, the call to prayer. And I think of what I've discovered, my experience is that when I read James and I hear these words, that the promise of prayer, the, the call to prayer, it seems so clear and so simple. And yet my experience of prayer sometimes has been far more complicated. Um, and that's what we want to dig into this morning. James, throughout this entire letter, he's, he's written this incredibly powerful, direct, overt, action-oriented letter where he says, life for the Christian is to be lived out of our faith in Jesus. So J James tells us that there is no room for this compartmentalized life where we will say in some areas of our life, I, I've surrendered control, Jesus is in charge, and I've, I've given everything over to him. And yet in other areas of our life, we say, I would, I would like to kind of keep the reins here. I would like to hold on. I, I want to be in charge in this area. James, that, that, that sort of understanding or approach to life, according to James, is, is antithetical to what we have in Christ, to who he is and what he's done for us. Christ is life, in James' view. And life is in Christ. They can't be separated. At least not in the life of, of the Christian. And so now as James is, is coming to this letter, he's finishing it up, and he's writing this church in a community of people as a result of their suffering, have been looking to their, pas their pastor and asking the question, what should we do? And James instructs them and says, you should pray. It seems so simple. The, the, the promise of prayer seems so straightforward, but again, this experience of, of prayer, well, that oftentimes feels a little bit more complicated. And so James is going to speak directly into these issues. So let's open our Bibles together to James chapter 5. We're at the very end of this letter now, and we're going to pick it up in verse 13 and read through the end of the chapter. This is what James writes. If anyone among you is in trouble, let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they've sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and should bring back that person, remember this. Remember this. 
Whoever turns a sinner from the air of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Now, as we look into these, these verses together, I think it's important to note that there are a number of ways that we could approach this text this morning, all of which would be valid and, and, and worth us looking at. But for our time together this morning, I simply want us to consider three qualities of prayer that James lays out for us in these verses, beginning with uh, the reality or the quality that prayer is relational. Prayer is relational. I often say uh, when we're wrapping up a study like this, when we've been looking at a New Testament letter, one of the epistles or Hebrews, like we talked about earlier in Ephesians, I think it's important to note how the author finishes their letter. Because oftentimes the author will, will add a point of emphasis in their concluding remarks that helps understand how we apply or integrate everything that they've been teaching us throughout this, uh, throughout this letter. And James here is no different. James is describing what a genuine saving faith in Jesus looks like when it's put into action. And so James, as he finishes, he helps us to understand that this is this, this obedience to Jesus, this faithful life to Jesus is only possible when we are experiencing intimate community with God. The life of obedience that James has described, particularly obedience in the face of, of suffering or in, in difficult times, is only possible if it is rooted in a deep, personal, relational time spent with God, and that's what prayer affords us. That's what it provides for us, relational time spent with God. So James says, are you in trouble? Then you should pray. You should commune with God, spend time with him. Are, are you happy? Then sing songs of praise, which is in and of itself a, a form of prayer. You should spend time in his presence, thanking him for the contentment that he's given you. James is telling us that this, this should be normative in, in the life of the church, in the heart of the Christian. Are you sick, James asks. The, the word that James uses here in that question when he says, are you sick, is more than physical illness, although it can include that. It, it refers to weakness in our life of any kind. It refers to our brokenness, whether that's physical or mental or emotional or spiritual. This is the same word that, that Paul uses in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when he talks about his thorn in the flesh and he boasts in his weakness because it's in his weakness that Christ's power is resting on him. So he says when you're weak, when you're broken, when you're sick, call the elders of the church, spiritually mature men and women, pr to pray over you, to anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord. Spend time together in his presence. Spend time seeking him in the midst of your weakness so that he will be your strength, James teaches us. See, the key to the life of obedience that, that we've been called to throughout this entire summer is, is dependence on God. And dependence on Him is, is what ultimately ushers us into His presence. Prayer is, is relational time spent with Him. The, the clearest picture that I have of this personally um, re results from a time in my life when my, my youngest daughter was just nine weeks old and, and um, spent a week at CDH Hospital um, in the pediatric intensive care unit. She, she had this uh, RSV and, and, and older kids, it's not that big of a deal and it kind of passes, but in, a, in an infant, tiny infant, um, it can be a very big deal and in, in her case was even life-threatening. So there came a point in time during the week where the doctors came to us and said, look, the, she's really struggling. And these next 24 hours are going to be critical for her. We need her to, to, to make some progress. And, and you can just imagine in the heart of a father, as a parent, you just, you're, you're filled with fear and anxiety and worry. And, and so we're there with her in the hospital the whole time. And, and all along, as she's just laying in her tiny little crib there, when we were sort of away from the crib, if we're talking to the doctor or something of that nature, she would get fussy and agitated and try to pull off her, her mask and, 
and, and just be upset. But what we discovered is that if we were there next to her and she was clinging to one of our little pinky fingers, she felt far more comfortable. And so Sherry and I, throughout the night, especially in that season when, when things were at their most critical, would sit next to her crib and, and hold out our hand, and she would grab onto our pinky, and, and as long as she had that connection, she seemed settled. And I just remember in that moment, sitting by her crib, and it was in the middle of the night, and, and, and I was there, and, and Naomi was holding onto my tiny little, or her, her tiny little hand was holding onto my pinky finger, and I just remember just praying in that instance and God just giving me this image, this understanding that as, as my little infant child was holding on to me, I had this hand just raised up to him and that was all I could do was just cling to him, just hold, just hold on to his presence, enter into his presence because I didn't, know, I didn't know where else to go. And I didn't even know how to pray in that moment because I was so afraid of, of what this was going to mean. And God is forever sort of burn that image into my head of, of what he wants for me to have this one hand out to the world that's around me, to the life that's in front of me, to the circumstances that I face, and one hand up that's just clinging to him and in his presence with him. And this is what James is modeling to us here. This is an invitation into his presence. So what do we do when we're suffering? What, what do we do when life is going well, we're in the midst of joy? What do we do when we are face to face with our weakness? James tells us to pray, to spend relational time with the sovereign God who loves us, who, who allows us into his presence to be with him in order to empower in us a life of faithfulness. And by the way, what James is describing here is is I think meant to be a regular, consistent, sort of habitual way of doing life. No matter what season we find ourselves in, James is, invites you, he instructs you to live, um, to live life out of the time that you've spent in his presence. And that's what prayer accomplishes for us. So James teaches us that, that prayer is relational, but he also now shows us the second quality of prayer, and that's simply that prayer is restorative prayer is restorative several years ago when when i was a young youth pastor i i used to be um blind as a bat um i i grew up with contacts and glasses and all of that sort of thing when i was a young youth pastor like i'd go on retreats and stuff and I'd take my contacts out for a night and like i could hear people moving around in the cabin but had no idea what was going on you know i was like i don't know who you are but shut up and go to bed <laughs> and uh and this doctor in Ohio, actually in the home, my hometown in Dayton, um, had this ministry that for people in full-time ministry, he would provide free LASIK eye surgery. Um, so it sounded too good to be true, but I called him up and said, hey, I'm, I'm in Chicago. Is, is this an option? He said, yeah, I just got to get you, I just got to get you on the schedule. And so um, it was about six months out. He put me on a schedule, set the date. Sherry and I went back to, to Ohio and, um, and we waited for this surgery. I remember Sherry being in the, um, the exam with me before they, they did the surgery. And just to give you an idea of kind of how my eyesight was, I had my glasses on and they had the little chart up on the wall that, that you look at. And I took off my glasses, but un, unbeknownst to me, they had flipped the chart down so it only had the single letter on the screen, the letter E. But I didn't know that. And they said, well, why don't you go ahead and read what's on the screen? I said, well, I'm assuming it's still the small lines. I said, I can't read that. That's just a blur. And Sherry sort of looked at me. She goes, it's just the big E. Like, <laughs> that's all that's up there. And I, I, I remember entering into that, that procedure just wondering, what is it going to be like to see again? What is it going to be like to be able to wake up in the morning and, and look across the room and see the clock? Like, what is it going to be like to operate the way that that these things were meant to operate the way they were designed for? What's it going to feel like to, to be restored, to have sight restored to me? And I remember just almost being overcome with emotion when, when the surgery was done and I sat up and it was blurriness because I had just finished the procedure, but I looked across the room and I could read the clock. I was like, I couldn't imagine that before in my life. See, look at, what, look at what James teaches us here, back in verse 15 of this passage. 
He says the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up, and if they've sinned, they will be forgiven. These are, these are bold words by James. Look at the promises here in this text. A prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, and secondarily, their sins, if they've sinned, their sin will be forgiven. Again, there's, there's boldness here. So what are we to make of these promises in these verses? Does this mean that, that if we pray for physical healing, uh, that it will be effective if we have enough faith? And how are we un, uh, to understand this in light of situations where God's people have gathered around, gathered together to earnestly in genuine faith seek him for healing, yet only to see that prayer go unanswered or at least not answered in the way that James describes here? And this isn't, this isn't theoretical for me. I, I've wrestled with these verses where, where I sought physical healing um, from God on behalf of someone I loved and, and yet saw that go unresolved. So how do we understand James' promises in view of our experiences? I mean, this is what I'm talking about earlier when I said sometimes it seems so simple, so straightforward and clear, and yet sometimes the experience of it feels more complicated. First, I think it's important for us to understand that James here is writing into a culture that understood illness or sickness to be the result of sin. We, we talked about this briefly last week when we looked at the example of Job earlier in James 5. How in the midst of his devastation, his friends gather around him and, and the only explanation that they can offer to his situation was that this had to be the result of of some personal sin on his part. But we saw the bigger story. And, and James protests. He, he declares his innocence. Another example in John chapter 9. The disciples see a man who is blind from the time of birth. And they say to Jesus, Who sinned, this man or his parents, that, that he would be born blind? And Jesus corrects them and say, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So, so Jesus nor James are teaching us that illness is the result of some personal sin in our lives. And we should be careful as the church to make that assumption either in ourselves or in someone else around us. However, James also understands that sin in our lives affects us in ways, in, in all kinds of ways, because we're holistic beings um, that include the physical and the mental and the emotional and the spiritual. So illness is not necessarily the result of, of personal sin, but sin can and does make us ill in a lot of ways. And this is what James appears to be addressing here. By the way, what's interesting to note on this, and Preparing for this sermon, I came across a couple um, studies, psychology studies, not, not, not their, uh, secular just research, which is basically validating some of this very same thing. They're not intentionally sort of looking and saying this is what James is teaching, and, but they're talking about the, the, the duplicitous life and how that affects us and the impact of that in, in all sorts of areas of our life. And perhaps you've even experienced this, this same idea where you've had a, a moment or a, a time in your life where you have addressed sin in your life and it has affected you in ways that not only are spiritual and in your relationship with God and relationship with other people, but, but maybe you would describe it as having a weight lifted off your shoulders. You feel restored, new, that you, you can walk in freedom. See, James, and here's the good news, James is teaching the church that these, these ramifications, these side effects of sin have a solution. And that solution, according to James, is a prayer offered in faith. This is what he describes as the restorative work of God. Again, look at verse 16. He says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Again, this is the promise of prayer. 
specifically as it relates to, to how sin impacts us, that we will experience healing. You remember Pastor Roger used to say this all the time in his battle with cancer. He would say things like, uh, I don't know if I will get better or not. We prayed for that. But he said, I've been healed a long time ago. What, what Christ had done is, life. so he says, you're going to be healed. He says, even greater yet, your sins will be forgiven. So prayer is relational. It's entering into God's presence. And prayer is, is restorative. Then lastly, we discover that prayer is experienced in community. Prayer is experienced in community. I, you know those things in life where it's possible to do it on your own, but it's so much more effective and, and um, enjoyable when there's community around you. I remember when my wife and I first started here at Chapel Street Church uh, 11 years ago, we were on the process of moving from where we lived in Wheaton out to the Tri-Cities. And I had somebody who, who came up, Keith Duncan, some of you know him, and said, hey, look, we'd, I'd love to put together a group of people to come and to help out your house and get it ready to sell. And, and of course, like every typical guy, you're sort of like, no, I've got this, I, thank you. But, um, and, but Keith was persistent. And I had this whole laundry list of things that needed to get done um, that our realtor had given us. And, and it seemed like this insurmountable task, but Keith showed up with a small army of, of men and women and students who gathered at our house on a Saturday afternoon. And by the end of that afternoon, it was entirely done. And I've always thought about that moment as this reflection of the power of community. We were able to list our house just a few days later and it sold five days after that because community came in and took that which was difficult or impossible by myself and made it uh, and realized it in a single afternoon. Look what James says here again. This is verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call on the elders of the church to pray over them and to anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Now down in verse 16, therefore confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Of course, there are many examples in the Bible where prayer and confession are individual and personal. Jesus, we're told, would withdraw to a lonely place to pray. And he did that as a model for us to follow. So, so James is not teaching us that prayer and confession must always take place in the context of community with other followers of Jesus, but he is teaching us that prayer in our lives and acts of confession should at times include community. And here's why. Because the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and it's effective. See, the healing that we crave, the, the freedom from the power of sin, the promise of forgiveness, James says, call, call the people together, leaders of your church, spiritually mature men and women and have them pray over you. James tells us, confess your sins to each other, pray for each other so that you may be healed. See, there's something powerful and effective about the body of Christ gathering around you, acknowledging the struggle, confessing sin, and then receiving their prayers on your behalf, experiencing the healing that James is teaching us here. Now, I know even as I say that, there are many of us here that in our hearts of hearts are saying, I'm not going to do that. This is, this is a private matter. This is between me and, and God, and there's too much shame or too much guilt or too much embarrassment involved for me to confess this to someone else and to, to ask them to pray for me. And I, I know that's the case because that's what my heart is saying when I read this. It's like, I don't want to do that. I, I don't want to step out and make myself vulnerable. I don't, I don't want people to see that side of me. But here's what I want you to know today. It, it is the confessed sin and the sin that is confessed in community that loses its power on us. Shame and guilt, those thrive in isolation and in hiding, but they cannot survive when they are brought into the light. Look what John uh, writes in 1 John, just a couple pages back here. This is in 1 John chapter 1. I think he describes so much of what James wants the, the church to understand here. 
He says, this is the message we've heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. So if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Again, this is John is describing what James is teaching us here at the end of, of this letter. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the, the German pastor and theologian um, who was a part of the, the German resistance during World War II and was later imprisoned and, and ultimately executed as a, result, uh, as a result of his participation in those resistance forces. He wrote a, a small and yet powerful book entitled Life Together. The last chapter of that book writes about and talks about the practice of prayer and confession in community. In that single chapter, in that little book, is one of the most important things outside of Scripture that I've ever read in my life. Because it convinced me that what James is describing here is true. And, and that it's actually worth the risk of, of opening up and inviting other people to speak into my weakness. And part of Bonhoeffer's explanation when he's talking about the power of confession in community is that, that there is, is restorative work, what we've talked about, when a brother or sister in Christ can, can come face to face with my sin, can hear it personally, and can look me in the eyes and say, you know what, there's grace for that. They can say to me, Sterling, Jesus died for that. And to tangibly hear those words and to tangibly hear that I have been washed clean from one of my brothers and sisters is one of the most powerful moments in my faith journey that I've ever experienced. The restorative work of God, but expressed through the community of God that he put around me. It's one of the greatest gifts that I've ever received. I, I still to this day... Um, wrestle at times with what James teaches here and, and that like I said earlier that desire in my heart to say I don't I don't want to do that I'm not sure that I want to invite people into this but James says is anyone among you in trouble let them pray is anyone happy let them sing songs of praise is anyone among you sick let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and to anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. And if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. As I conclude this morning, in just a moment, Anton and the worship team are going to return and we'll have the opportunity just to respond and worship. But each and every Sunday, whether it's here at the Kesslinger campus or for those over at Mill Creek right now, you know that we have prayer teams available. My encouragement to you, if, if the Spirit is prompting your heart to not only meet and enter into God's presence in prayer, but to do so in community, is to engage in that today. What, whatever prevents that in you, my prayer is that you will overcome that fear and that hesitation, and that we will experience as the church what James promise, promises it, uh, to us is available through our Savior. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to meet with you, to enter into your word, to study this letter together. Lord, I pray even now, God, that, that, that we would be men and women and a body, children and students, people of prayer, that our, our faithfulness and our obedience to you would be driven from experiencing time where we just enter into your presence. Continue your restorative work in us. And may it be normative here for us to be people that pray for each other, that confess to each other, and that speak grace and hope and life into each other. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.